But the focus has been really about the auto sector with the PLI scheme getting approved. So let's try and understand what does it mean for the industry and various players. We have with us on the show right now Dr. Pavan Goenka, former MD at m and and chairperson of the Space Regulator in Space uh, Organization as well joining in on the show right now. Dr. Goenka, great to have you on the show. Hope all things safe uh, and well with you. Yes, it is, Ayesha, and uh, good to talk to you after a long time. Yes, it is. We all got a little worried uh, seeing your tweet about the Omicron virus and how everyone should really up their guards. Well, I was hoping that uh, that sort of asked uh, people to be a little more careful, nothing more than that. Everyone is fine. Hmm. Okay, great to hear that. Just wanted to understand, Dr. Goenka, what is it that you're making of the PLI Hello. scheme right now? And how really do you think this scheme is going to help reduce the components import bill, which stands at a staggering 17 billion rupees as of now, and whether or not it's going to increase India's global market share from the current 2%? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I lost the uh, audio for uh, two seconds. You'll have to repeat what you said. Sure. I wanted to know, uh, Dr. Goenka, how the PLI scheme is going to help uh, the auto components import bill reduction and whether or not it will also help it increase the global market share which stands at 2% currently. Yeah, yes, uh, that is uh, obviously the objective uh, of the PLI scheme on both uh, reducing import and increasing export. And I would like to say that the scheme is very smartly designed. Uh, 26,000 crore of outlay for the scheme is not a small sum of money, but it's been planned in a way that the money is going to go where it's going to be um, uh, giving us the maximum benefit. For example, rather than supporting uh, the, the sort of day in, day out kind of materials where India has very high cost benefit, uh, they're supporting the advanced technology uh, components. Uh, and that's where India is doing maximum import. Uh, and, and if you look at the facts and figures, uh, they are really uh, uh, eye-openers. Uh, many people uh, don't uh, uh, believe that Indian auto industry, though it is one of the most Atmanirbhar industry of major industries, still imports $25 billion worth of components every year. Uh, and some of it is uh, because of the cost competitiveness that India does not have. Uh, and some of it is because of technology uh, that India does not have. And I think what the scheme does is uh, uh, takes care of the cost disability, especially for the advanced technology components, uh, and incentivizes the uh, suppliers, especially multinational suppliers, who are currently uh, doing kind of CKD assembly in India of their systems by uh, producing almost everything else outside. And for them to set up plants in India, justify the investment in India, uh, is what the whole thrust is. And what India is lacking right now for advanced technology components is scale. Uh, and what this will do is provide that scale, not just for consumption in India, but also for export from India. Similarly, if you look at the export side, uh, India is exporting only about $15 billion worth of components out of a total market of 1.2 trillion. Uh, that's just about 1.2 or 1.3%. Uh, and therefore, once again, there, uh, through the help of this scheme uh, and justifying investments, taking care of cost disabilities that India has, uh, I think we'll be able to do a lot better uh, than that. Uh, and, and in a sense, as I've always said, the PLI scheme is a five-year window to get our act together uh, in the sense that we need to ensure that at the, at the end of five years, uh, without the help of PLI scheme, we remain cost competitive and be able to uh, continue to have lower import and higher expense. Sure. But Dr. Winka, just to play devil's advocate here, I mean, does this scheme also not encourage international players, I mean, the likes of Ford, Harley Davidson, Chevrolet, etc., to also come back to India and uh, set up shop here and thereby perhaps even get a government preference in that sense? Well, so the, the objective here is to increase manufacturing valuaries in India. Uh, I don't think Indian government is distinguishing between whether it is done by a company that has its sort of headquarters in India or a company that has a headquarters in Korea or Japan or China or US. 
Uh, what we are looking for is how to do more value addition in India, how to create more investment in India, how to create more jobs in India, uh, and how to earn more for an exchange and uh, spend less for an exchange and import in India. And if that objective is met by having a multinational to truly set up a manufacturing plant, not just a, a CKD, SKD assembly, but truly set up a manufacturing plant, I think that will just help our economy overall. That will just help our employment overall. So I don't think there is any reason to exclude uh, uh, attempts from uh, multinationals to do full manufacturing in India. In fact, what you would find is that most of the high technology components, for example, if you take uh, all the engine equipment, uh, the, the injection equipment, that's all done by multinational. There is no Indian company uh, really uh, who has that technology uh, themselves. Uh, and what we are going to be incentivizing with this scheme is those multinationals should be making the core production in India rather than doing it in China or Vietnam or someplace else. And that's just going to help India in case of value addition. So uh, I, I, I think you're right that yes, it will incentivize foreign manufacturers also. And I believe it's perfectly all right to do so as long as they are do, uh, doing uh, value addition in it. What I also wanted to understand, Dr. Gwenka, considering you have a large, you know, fisheye lens to really map what's going on with the industry is, uh, given that the EV market is now picking up in India as well, and the PLI scheme in some sense is poised to benefit this entire, you know, revolution, if I can call it that, uh, what do you think is going to be the next big trigger for EVs and whether or not the PLI scheme, especially for auto components, is only going to aid this uh, growth forward? See, uh, you know, the automotive PLI has really two separate parts, distinct parts. One is the incentivizing of advanced uh, automotive technology components, uh, which is what we just talked about. Another part is to incentivize the clean energy vehicle, which includes electric vehicle, which includes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, includes uh, ethanol vehicles. Uh, and, and this is really the second part of the big story uh, that, uh, that we have here. Now, uh, if I uh, sort of go back in terms of what Indian government has done at the, at the central level to incentivize electric vehicles, they have done quite a bit. Uh, they have first started with a lower GST, then did the famous scheme, and now the PLI scheme. Now, in the PLI scheme, uh, you will get as much as 13 to 15% of your overall uh, selling price uh, uh, incentivized by the government of India in the PLI scheme. And that's a huge benefit. And with that benefit, I believe all the difference that we have in terms of the cost of buying a electric vehicle, in a sense, go away with a combination of the three things, the GST, the FAME scheme, and the PLI scheme. Now, there's no reason whatsoever why a consumer should reject electric vehicle on the basis of pricing. I'm talking right now of two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and buses. Uh, on the passenger car, still uh, th there is uh, uh, some more sort of uh, observation that we have to do, uh, where the problem right now is not so much of price, but the problem is more that we don't have enough models in the market uh, for the consumers to choose from. Uh, we have basically about two models in the mainstream price range, which is both Tata, Nexon, and uh, Tigor. Uh, and what is required here is more models. But to come back to your specific questions, I would say that if this now, <clears throat> cannot really give us a significant accelerated ramp of electric vehicles in India. Nothing would. Uh, and, and, and the ball now is in the court of the industry, uh, both the supplier side and the, uh, the, the OEM side, to come out with more and more models to reduce the selling price for the consumers and also uh, to uh, do a significant level of uh, uh, market distribution of electric vehicles. Uh, that is just one part. The second part is it's up to the aggregators. And I think aggregators, especially in four wheelers, very big role to play, very big role to play to make electric vehicles uh, popular. Because if you can imagine if Ola and Uber decide that all their future buys will be electric vehicles, pretty soon you are going to see a whole lot of electric vehicles on the road. Two wheelers, three wheelers are on their way. They will happen. Nothing can stop it. Uh, buses are on their way, they'll happen, nothing can stop it. Uh, and I think government has set up a target for 2025, which I believe is a very realistic target. And frankly, I would like to see us do little more than what the target is. 
uh, which is 16% for two wheelers, 20% uh, for three wheelers, 5% for cars, and 13% for buses. Uh, this is a realistic uh, target. Uh, we should be able to achieve it, but everybody has to work together. And the, the suppliers, the OEMs, government has done their bit. And now the state governments, that's another thing that I would like to point out. State governments are coming out in a big way uh, to, uh, to set up uh, EV policies where they're, they're giving incentives beyond what the, uh, what the central government is doing, and also by giving benefits of uh, parking, uh, uh, registration, uh, uh, fee waiver, and so on and so forth. Uh, that should really take the electric vehicle forward. I think, I think in the next two years, you're going to see a very big ramp up, at least in two-wheeler, three-wheeler, uh, and, and, and maybe uh, uh, passenger cars will take somewhat more time because we don't have enough models. Mr. Goenka, good morning. Always wonderful to connect with you. This is Nikunj also joining in. Uh, Mr. Goenka, while we may build on new models, better infrastructure, the problem is that the raw material required for batteries is something which is not originating in India. It's like saying that we still need crude and we need to import crude too for our energy demands. So we may be doing all the right things, all the right policy reforms, but it ultimately stops at the EV and the raw material required for batteries. So this is a very good point and a point that has been debated quite a bit uh, for quite some time. So uh, we had done uh, calculations early on, uh, and I'm sure they are still valid, that even if you assume for the time being that all of your raw material that goes into battery, that is lithium, nickel, cadmium, uh, is 100% important, it will be because India doesn't have a source for it. And if you do everything else in India, including making the cells, uh, which uh, again, another PLI scheme is covering making the cells, our overall life cycle import uh, for an electric vehicle will be far lower. I think it's less than half uh, than the import that we have for running a IC engine a vehicle running on fossil fuel. Uh, so, so from that viewpoint also it is lower. The second point that you should keep in mind that electric vehicle technology or battery technology is evolving. Today we are fully dependent on lithium, cadmium and nickel uh, for the battery constraints, but tomorrow it may not be the case. There are so many different materials uh, that people are experimenting with. And none of this, I would admit, is close to being commercially viable. But it's a matter of five years, eight years, 10 years, before you will see something else come up, which is in abundant uh, availability in India. For example, aluminum. Uh, there's a lot of work happening with solid state battery, a lot of work happening where aluminum is being used. Uh, there, there are two companies, one in Israel, one in India, uh, startups that are working on it in a very big way and not very far from, uh, from demonstration of this technology. So I would think that 10 years from now, it's not the lithium and cadmium and nickel that will necessarily form the, the, the core of electric vehicle cell. It will be something else. We don't know what that something else is, but it will be something else. And I would think that it will really be useful. It will be good if India pursues research uh, on alternate material for, for batteries. And there's a lot of work happening at a, what I would consider a low level. I think we need to kind of put a lot more weight behind it so that Indian researchers can come out with uh, uh, material for making the cells that would re reduce dependence on lithium, cadmium, and, 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 and nickel. And one more last point on this, which is also very important, that lithium is something that is fully recyclable. Uh, and therefore, once we have volumes, uh, right now the volumes are very small, but once we have volumes, I'm sure the whole industry will come out, which will recycle lithium. Uh, and, and, and obviously, you will not be able to recycle 100%. Something will get lost. But if you're able to recover 75 from lithium uh, from, uh, from battery, uh, then, uh, then your dependence on lithium import may go down. So there, there are many, many, many things here that would probably make this concern that we have today. It's a valid concern. Uh, less of a concern as time goes on. Okay. Last question, sir. We've seen one side Tesla, Tesla creating magic in terms of an innovator company. But if I look at the Indian landscape, here the incumbents are essentially also the uh, adopters. In this entire EV migration, where do you see value getting created? The incumbents, Mahindra, Tata, or it's going to be a complete innovators and new companies which would be the new rulers? 
Well, the easiest thing for me to say is a little bit of both. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's it's not necessarily just a good thing to say. It's also the right thing to say. So let me uh, take some time, Nikunj, on explaining uh, why I'm saying this. Uh, let's start with two-wheelers. Uh, in two-wheelers, uh, the fact is that the big uh, companies stayed away uh, from two-wheelers for a long time, and they still are uh, lukewarm. They are all working on it, but they have not really launched in a big way. And where the big push has come on electric two-wheeler is from the companies like Arthur, uh, who have done everything uh, ground up within India, and they have done a significant amount of localization, uh, uh, and, and not just importing components from China and assembling it. Uh, if you look at uh, Ola, for example, they have betted big on electric vehicles. Uh, and uh, similarly, Hero Electric, which was one of the early adopters of electric vehicles, they are the companies that have really come forward. And um, the big guys are now coming in, uh, the Bajaj, the TVS, and the Hero Motor Cop. And I think uh, this is a segment where there will be coexistence of uh, uh, the new people, the new players, uh, and, and uh, of the old, old players. Now, when it comes to three-wheelers, similar story. The big guys, Mahindra's and Piaggio, uh, came in the game early on. Uh, Bajaj still hasn't really come in. But there are many, many, many small players. In fact, I just heard of one this morning that I had never heard of before, uh, who are, who are uh, trying to get into three-wheeler. Uh, and in two-wheeler, three-wheeler, still there are many other companies that are innovating. But the problem that I see in all of these is that there is not a very clear disruption in technology. Nothing like what Tesla has done, where they have totally done something different. And what I'm still waiting for in two-wheeler, three-wheeler field is a disruption in technology that will suddenly say, oh, this is the vehicle that I want to buy. When it comes to four-wheelers, uh, the, the uh, overall launches have been uh, very, very few. Um, Tata's, Mahindra's early on, uh, uh, and Hyundai and uh, uh, MG are about the only ones that have launched vehicles. MG and uh, Hyundai have just brought in what they have in their whole home country. And Tata and Mahindra have launched uh, sort of low-end vehicles. Uh, I think these companies will have to put in, uh, I don't know if you're aware that Mahindra has developed under its subsidiary a vehicle in Europe, electric vehicle, that will sell for 2 million euro. And now that's the kind of technology I hope that Mahindra will uh, desire, decide to bring into India someday. Uh, and, 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 and disrupt that. But I would think that the four-wheeler field in India would more or less stay with the traditional player. It will be very much more difficult for new players to come into that four-wheeler field because of very high level of investment required. And buses, um, there are one or two new players like JBM who were not in buses have come in, uh, but uh, primarily it will uh, remain the game with uh, uh, the traditional player, the Leyland and uh, and and. Uh, uh, Tata. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think two-wheeler, three-wheeler will see a lot of new players. Four-wheelers and buses will be primarily uh, the established players. I don't know if that's the question you had asked, but uh, if I've not answered your question, you can restate. Venka, you always answer the questions straight up. That's why it's always a pleasure interviewing you. This is Nen Taran. We were so keen to have you on the channel today because, you know, you were also India's representative to work with the government on all of these uh, PLI schemes. I won't put you in a spot and ask you if you had oats for breakfast, uh, but it's a great update to have from you on what's happening yes, in uh, India uh, when it comes uh, to the disruption, the EV space, like and uh, no one better than like Dr. Goika to take it. Yeah. So I may add one point. Hello. Of course, sir. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, state here that uh, the Ministry of Heavy Industry, uh, which has uh, designed the PLI scheme, I have tremendous compliment that I want to offer to the ministry for the very simple reason in the way they have gone about it. Uh, from the very beginning, they consulted Siam and ECMA uh, to understand from Siam and ECMA that what is being imported what is not being exported, and what the government needs to do to incentivize that. And Siam and ACMA were very closely involved in deciding the list of components uh, that will be incentivized. Uh, and after launching this scheme, they, in fact, held a very big conference in Goa, uh, where they had all the stakeholders uh, invited to really understand and review on how do we make this now functional, how do we make this workable. I think this is a very good example of the government and the industry, including state departments, state governments, working together to do something that 
could really have a very big impact uh, on the auto industry, especially the manufacturing value addition in India. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, on, on TV, compliment the ministry uh, for really doing uh, what may be a very good example of public partner, partner or a government uh, industry partnership. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, let's see how this pans out. A lesson there on how we can progress and uh, look at the China Plus uh, strategy. Dr. Goenka, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us live today on The Market. Thank you, Ayesha. Thank you, Nikunj.